yeah, probably like five to six people that I've made them sell their mirrorless cameras and buy Lumix cameras. Like I don't use Lumix cameras because they brought subscribers to my YouTube channel. I use them because they make my life as a professional easier. It's like, we're the girlfriend that wants to be proposed to. They keep taking us to like Taylor Swift con concerts. They keep taking us to like beautiful vacations and then like getting down on one knee and tying their shoes. They're just thinking we need to make the next best thing. I mean, I hope they're watching this. This is your warning. In this episode of the Lumix Careers podcast, we're sitting down with a good friend of mine, Anthony Rodriguez, who is an Orlando-based filmmaker who runs a video production company and has a YouTube channel on the side where he talks about filmmaking gear and talking about his honest and truthful thoughts about all that. Now, in today's episode specifically, we're gonna be diving into some various topics. Why he's been choosing to shoot on Lumix even after shooting on Sony, Canon, and RED, the improvements that need and must are a huge must for that next Lumix camera, and and a little bit about the reviewer bias and drama that's been happening in the filmmaking niche in on YouTube. But without further ado, Anthony. What's up, man? What's up, man? Dude. That last one was a zinger. Before we get into that, because those are going to be the hot topics later on in this conversation, um, who is Anthony? To my audience, just give them a little bit of context if they've never seen your channel, who you are, and what you kind of what you do. So I would classify myself as a video marketer first. So I'm not a YouTuber. I am just passionate about making companies more money. So that's through the avenue of video. Um, my background is cinematography and videography, which are two different things, but uh, I just like to create beautiful images and make people more money. So uh, that's what I do for business. And then for YouTube, I guess it translates as well because uh, yeah, I like teaching people to create beautiful images and save their money on gear. Uh, I will be talking more about how to make more money as a creative professional, um, which I don't know how my audience will take that, but we'll, we'll see. We'll see the 10 views on, on, on a video that uh, makes people money as opposed to sells them gear. I mean, you've definitely taken off like from when you started your YouTube channel and you've kind of had that lift right off the bat. Would you would you agree to that? It's funny, dude. I was completely unaware of the YouTube space. I still I am a little bit more aware now, but um, I guess I I just don't care that much. <laughs> like I just I really I just don't care that much. When I did, interestingly enough, it was Lumix stuff. Like people know me. I buy and sell gear all the time, and. I'll sell a camera to somebody and they're like, oh, I know you, you have the Lumix video. I'm like, yeah, okay. So I guess <laughs> that was like one of the first videos and like most of my videos that have pop popped off on my channel are about Lumix cameras. And I love Lumix cameras. Like I don't use Lumix cameras because it brought subscribers to my YouTube channel. I use them because they make my life as a professional easier and they're just better than most of what I've used so far. Um, I'm not sponsored by Lumix. I honestly, even if they offered, I probably would uh, not do it unless they paid me a ridiculous amount of money, which they probably won't. So <laughs> I, I just, I have no interest in that. I, I, I do well enough in the, the production side than to, to have to have that on the side for YouTube. Yeah, so these are a couple questions I tend to ask most first time guests on the show, but what brought you to Lumix and what was that first Lumix camera you've actually ever owned? It was anamorphic stuff. So uh, about three years ago, I, was it three years ago? Where I found out a, a lot of my favorite movies were filmed in anamorphic. I didn't even know what that was. I thought it was just these streaks and and whatever Star Wars stuff. And um, when I found out the actual look of anamorphic and the the bokeh, the the barrel distortion, the whole the whole idea behind anamorphic and that was and that that was what I was actually desiring when I watched movies, when I wanted to create images. 
I quickly just dove straight into anamorphic lenses and all that stuff. But then all of my cameras had 16 by nine sensors because that's every camera that's out there that's a mirrorless camera and most cinema cameras, which you can, <laughs> I'd use quotations because uh, I just think it's a dumb term with other cameras, but they just don't have open gate. And open gate is the reason why most anamorphic lenses are able to be used and you're not dealing with a small, tiny sliver of an image, which when I first got an anamorphic, it was like a 1.6 Suray lens and um, my image was super small. I had to crop in. So my first camera was an S1H that I bought on Marketplace, got it super cheap. And after using it, it was just... The image was beautiful. The I bought it for anamorphic and I loved it for all the other reasons, which is IBIS, the actual image, the, the video features that I never had in my other cameras, even though I had an FX3, which was a cinema camera. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, it was cool. It, it felt like Lumix was like an, an outlier that uh, just didn't have any features uh, spec wise. <laughs> that we were all needing, but they had everything else. So that was my first Lumix camera. I ended up selling it because I needed autofocus at the time. And uh, yeah. Yeah. And then later on, you kind of, uh, like you kind of mentioned, you bought a lot of cameras, sold a lot of cameras, bought a lot of cameras, sold through the whole process. So what is your kind of current camera setup right now? Well, I had two Ronin 4Ds. <laughs> I just sold one. Um, but I, then I have three Lumix cameras and I'm really tempted to just buy more like, cause I have multi-cam shoots and stuff and the, they're not the best with the latency and HDMI lag, but, um, yeah, I have a Lumix S5 II, an S5 IIX, and then an S9 and I could do basically everything. And then I have one Ronin 4D, um, and then a bunch of ac action cameras, 360, all that crap to create cool uh, visual effects and stuff, but. But the Ronin 4D is also L mount too, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons, that's one of the reasons why I bought it again. So after I had Lumix cameras, the Ronin 4D came out with an L mount. And I loved that camera when I first bought it. This is my second time, bro, I cycle through gear all the time, but uh, yeah, it has L mount, so. It just made sense. It's a great camera. That's a whole nother conversation, but. So I, I think one thing for my audience to kind of know is like, you are tend to be one of the people on the platform that is 100% unfiltered in terms of your opinion towards just different things. Like you'll, you'll say it how it is. And you've shot on Canon, you've shot on Sony, you've shot DJI, you've shot Red, and you shot Lumix it would be also interesting to hear what do you think Lumix does really well and great on their cameras in comparison to other brands? And maybe since we've already talked about open gate, the anamorphic shooting, all of that, maybe a different feature besides that. Well, their IBIS is just incredible. Like every, and it's funny, <laughs> I'm almost like a Lumix evangelist to like, and not on my channel, like, but to my friends, because I, I don't like just geeking out on my channel too much. I, I, I try to be objective and obviously I'm super opinionated in general. That's just like who I am as a person. Um, but to my friends, I've put them on Lumix cameras. Like I can, I can point out, yeah, probably like five to six people that I've made them sell their mirrorless cameras and buy Lumix cameras. And I tell them because of the image quality, the IBIS and the video features they come back to me and the main thing everybody talks about is I don't really need a gimbal anymore. I don't use gimbals that much, if ever. So uh, I would say the IBIS is probably one of the biggest things that Lumix is just the best, you know? And then secondary is image quality. Uh, the image is just thick. I, I, don't, I don't know how else to explain it. It's just, it's a rich image. It's an image that I can trust. I don't know if that makes sense. Cause I, I used Canon cameras and um, the FX3 is fine. Like I, I can work with it. I, I could work with any camera, but FX3 is I guess enjoyable sometimes. Uh, it has a little plasticky 
at times, but the Lumix cameras, I don't know, I could just trust that image. And this is coming from somebody that has used cinema cameras, that has used really high-end uh, production cameras, and I just trust the image, you know? I, I know that, that I'm going to pull as much as I need personally. And I can't say that about every camera manufacturer, at least, not the manufacturer, but at every camera line, like mirrorless, let's just say mirrorless camera, every mirrorless camera. I'd be also kind of curious to hear your point on this perspective too, is what do you think that Lumix, and it could be with their current camera, I know we've mentioned, or you talked about the HDMI lag latency and stuff like that, yeah. but what do you think they need to improve on with, you know, that next camera to like catch up with Sony, like, like an S1H Mark II, you know. So is this gonna be the rest of the episode, bro? Cause <laughs> I can go on for the next like 20 minutes. About the... I'm just kidding. No, um, a lot, a lot. I think the menu system is something people don't talk about. And you actually disagree with me on this, which is fine. <laughs> which is, it's okay. But I think it's trash. Um, <laughs> like, I just don't think it's good coming. Sony used to be bad. Now they're not. But like going back and forth from Sony cameras and even some camera, Canon uh, cameras, I think the menu system is really just not good. There are a bunch of features that are hidden. And it's funny when we debate on it, I'm always like, how do you do this? <laughs> like I'll call you and you'll be like, I think it, oh, it's not here. Wait, it's probably in this many, I have to click on this and then click on this and then get these two settings to make sure that this one setting works properly. So if they would streamline it, I think the menu system uh, is a pretty big one. Touch tracking is huge. I've heard Sean, apparently Sean's going to be the podcast right before me, but I've talked to Sean directly about this. We need touch tracking. We need touch tracking in every single mode. Doesn't matter what's going on, but no, we, we need touch tracking. Like Sony, has that and that's one of the i guess things that i miss the most is that i can touch the screen whenever in whatever mode it doesn't matter i don't have to be in a dedicated touch tracking mode to use touch tracking and then whatever i touch it's going to follow always like that is something that we need no questions asked i don't care what any human being says another thing i'd say is uh the ease of use with like audio modules so uh, that's something that I haven't heard talked about too much, but I've run into a little bit of friction, even with the XLR unit. And I know they came out with a new one and stuff. Uh, but yeah, there's really not that much else besides specs. Like uncropped 4K 120, just to have it. I don't use it that much, but I want to have it. I want to have it there. Um, the same things that everybody else talks about, like a box camera, sure. Uh, internal NDs with a mirrorless mount and IBIS, I actually don't think that's possible in a camera of this price point. But if it is, that would be amazing. But people always say the Burano, now, now I'm going on a tangent, but people say the Buranos can do it, but the Burano's IBIS sucks. <laughs> like, yeah, it's nowhere, it doesn't suck, mind you. It's, it's just not that great. So this is gonna be an even harder technological feat than to just oh, reverse engineer Burano and have IBIS internal NDs and a mirrorless mount. It's just a completely different IBIS mechanism. So, um, but I mean, there's patents out there about like an internal ND with like a drop in filter and then it uses some, I do, I, I think it's called either crystallization or some other word. Uh, but it's basically where it's doing a chemical reaction to change the variable ND electronically speaking, not physically speaking. So those things are out there for sure. I definitely feel like the most logical route that Lumix would potentially take from pure speculation with just guessing is I think an S1 Mark II would come first to be that hybrid photo slash video camera. I'm assuming something similar to the Sony a7S III, which is a bit of a bummer. I'm really hoping there's something else the in one that, that camera. The that came out four years ago? 
the Sony. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, the one that's exactly. Because <laughs> Lumix has been very well known in the past to be very innovators, like with the GH5 coming out being the first camera with, you know, 4K with 10 bit with a log profile. But then all these other cameras came up, and now it feels like Lumix is catching up. But I'm hoping at the very minimum, whatever that S1 Mark II camera comes out, not only has the same specs and features from that the Sony a7S III has, and it most likely will have 32-bit float recording. Hopefully, maybe it has some type of, you know, RAW, ProRes RAW in there, obviously similar to the GH7. But hopefully, I'm, and I don't know what the answer is. I don't think it's 8K. I don't, I think that's kind of unnecessary for the price point and the capacity. Like we're, the reality is we're all shooting 4K, 6K, and sometimes even 8K. And then we're exporting like 1080 for social media too. Yeah. So it's like, or at least we should be, which is funny. Or, yeah, we don't. should be. That's true. We should be, but most people aren't. Yeah. And we should be shooting all in 30 or 60 frames a second for social media, but we're also not doing that. Yeah, yeah. But besides that point, I think the S1 Mark II would be a more realistic camera because it's that hybrid camera for high-end photography and high-end video needs. And then hopefully an S1H Mark II design in a box-style camera. I don't even know if you've heard of this. There was an AW50B uh, or something like that and an AW40B, which is basically the updated BS1H and an updated BGH whatever so it's basically the yeah, the updated box cameras with yeah. a couple more uh features now heavy from, quotes on updated yeah heavy heavy quotes on update for sure <laughs> yeah, but... now what i've heard actually though is um since panasonic and lumix merged together um the uh -huh. broadcasting team and the lumix team um that those updated cameras are actually coming from the Panasonic team from broadcasting because now those are specifically broadcast only. But my working theory is here on YouTube trying to get, you know, predict the future right now is I think the reason they're not calling those cameras the BS1H Mark II, for example, is because an S1H Mark II will be a box. Oh, camera. yeah, yeah. I remember us talking about that. Yeah yeah so that's that's like my hope and my theory behind that whole system is that the b the s1h mark ii hopefully you know probably in i don't know september of next year let's say will be coming out i don't think it's yeah. as soon as everyone wants it i'm hoping there's something that will tithe over tithe everyone over like an s1 mark ii because that logically makes more, more sense to be released first but i think it's just like people are getting upset you know what's you up you know what's so funny here's this is what it's like it's like we're the girlfriend that wants to be proposed to and we keep getting they keep taking us to like taylor swift com concerts they keep taking us to like beautiful vacations and then like getting down on one knee and tying their shoes. <laughs> they're like, they're like, and we're like waiting to be proposed to. And Lumix is the boyfriend that's getting on one knee and's like, hey, do you know what you want for dinner tonight? Like, and we think we're about to like, we think we're about to receive what we've all been waiting for. Yeah. The ring. Yeah. And I think it's interesting because lately there's been a lot of speculation on the internet, but it's not speculation where it's like, this is what I want. Similar to what we're doing right now. We're just saying, this is what we want, but we're not saying this is what's coming out on October 8th. It's going to be the S1H Mark II with all of these specs. And it's creating all of this like hype that Lumix, you know, doesn't want because that's not what's coming out on October 8th. <laughs> It Everyone's was like telling the girlfriend, hey, this this is it. This is this, it. You're about you to get, get your, your nails done. Yeah, get you know? your nails done. Get your hair Don't done. Get your freaking nails done. Nothing's happening. I'm kidding. But I, I don't know, man. Like, one thing I appreciate about Lumix is the fact that, and I also don't appreciate it. It's a, I, I do appreciate it, but I don't. So it's like, almost like parental correction, but I, <laughs> I appreciate that they're taking their time because I know they're going to get it done right. 
if they're taking their time and it comes out and there's a bunch of bugs, like I think Lumix is actually screwed. Um, I mean, I hope they're watching this. This is your warning. Like, you <laughs> you'll just be screwed. Um, I might stick around, but <laughs> I definitely know a good handful of people that won't. Like a lot of the people that I talk to, even some of my audience that I've influenced to shoot with Lumix, just from the videos that I've made, from the images that I've created with the cameras. And the, I know a lot of those people won't, won't shoot with Lumix anymore. So like this next Lumix camera, not to sound too serious and go too intense into it, like this next Lumix camera definitely needs to be a home run. And I know, I know engineers at Lumix are sweating. <laughs> like, can you imagine their job right now? That Like their only job, they're not thinking about anything else besides their families, if they have families. Like they're just thinking, we need to make the next best thing or we're crapped. You know, the S5 II was great, our sales are up. Now we just need to drop everyone's jaws and come out with something and give a loaner out to Anthony Rodriguez so that he can review it. <laughs> but, um, and be honest, I'll, I'll be honest about it. But anyways, I, I wanna, I don't know, I guess in, in my relationships, I, I do wanna see everything from the other person's perspective. So uh, even though Lumix is a company, it's a, run by a bunch of people, you know? So I do wanna see it from their perspective in that sense and not just, Lumix, you stupid boyfriend. What are you, why are you taking your time? <laughs> And giving me that ring yeah and i think this is like a good example too where it's like you know there's uh in the conversation i had with sean which as we're talking is not actually released yet so you wouldn't have heard it but <laughs> in the conversation i had with sean we were kind of talking about when the gh5 got announced like and i forgot what year that was the GH6 was already in like process of like starting to develop that camera right when the GH5 got launched. And the S9 was in conversation when the S5 II dropped. So it's like they've been working on it, but it's similarly to like everyone was like, all right, give us the GH6, give us the GH6, give us the GH6. And then they didn't put face detect on it. And if they waited like eight more months, it would have had face detect, autofocus, GH6 would have dropped and everyone would have been like, Yes, this is like the Micro Four Third camera that was supposed to be. But that wasn't the story, you know? The story was everyone from the community perspective was like, give it, uh, like, give us this camera right now. We want it now. And it's like, all right, here's the camera. And then it's like, everyone's like, well, this doesn't, camera doesn't have face detect. And besides the whole streaking issues, well, that's, that's a whole nother thing. Still having the pulsing issues. And it's like, ah, you know, it's like, it's one of those things where it's like, if we just let them give them eight more months, it would have had face detect and would have been a lot better of a camera. But it's also, you know, to to continue this example of the boyfriend proposing in, yeah. <laughs> in this episode, there's also like a fine line of like, okay, the community can't wait around that long, like for that camera. And it's like, it's is slowly getting to the point where you're like, all right, it's been six years from an update from the S1. Not even the S1H, because the S1H is also about to be six years too, next year, I believe. So it's like, it's been a long time and we need that next camera to come out um, before it's, you know, in a sense, before it's too late and people are trying, starting to jump ship and starting to switch over to different camera systems because of the constant release schedules. I will say yeah. it is also nice from the perspective of like, shooting on Lumix, them continuing to firmware update, for example, the S5 II X. Yeah, yeah. Not getting the proxy recordings, getting yeah, that better stabilization, sick. like all of that stuff, I think we need to remember it's like, okay, the S5 II X came out almost two years ago at this point, and we got features like proxy recording, and we got features like the stabilization, and now we have the app integration. So it's like, yeah, features I actually are still use coming that proxy out. recording a lot. Cause I hate making proxies. So I, I got, I got a whole, I got a whole nother reason why I'm going to use Lumix cameras. Like funny enough, I don't want to derail you too much, but that proxy recording is one of the reasons why for some shoots, I only shoot with my Lumix cameras and I won't use my 4d. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of like the, the once Lumix comes out with their next 
full frame cameras being the S1 Mark II, S1 H Mark II. It's kind of like when Apple, I forgot when it was, but when, before the M1 chips, Apple had oh, the Intel yeah. chips. And that yeah. was a huge leap in terms of technology, in terms of speed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then the M1 to M2 is like minor, like upgrades. It's like not, almost nothing. Exactly. I don't even know what the difference is, to be honest. I haven't even looked at it. So I guess transitioning a little bit from, you know, what Lumix can improve, you know, here it comes. What Lumix can kind of improve on, what the entire camera industry as a whole, where it could be potentially going. This year, there's been uh, quite a bit of drama on YouTube, uh, specifically only in the filmmaking, cinematography, videography niches with, you know, the, the Pixis. Then there was the S9, well, Pixis and the side monitor, the S9 with the price point, the review bias, um, and now I guess also something with Blazar lenses, which I, I haven't actually watched much. That's such a small watched drama. Much. I wouldn't even call it a drama. Hopefully you wouldn't not. even call it. Hopefully not. <laughs> But the S9 um, definitely was for sure yeah. one big point. But yeah. probably the biggest of the entirety of that. And like as someone who's also was part of the trip and went to Japan and experienced some of the hate. And it was always so interesting because a lot of the hate comments, at least on the Lumix creators, I'll call them, people that just create content about Lumix cameras on channel. A lot of the comments are like people that never comment on our channels ever before. And then all of a sudden, it's the exact same comment on like every single video. So it seems like the hate was so much bigger than it was. So, but I think you had a, a video that kind of recently dropped, kind of talking about the whole review bias that you know creators have, like the perspective on viewers, like and all of that. Um, what's in your perspective do you think has been happening recently on this platform well honestly like i think as creators and it doesn't matter how many subscriber count you have like it doesn't make you a more experienced human being like people can have a following and it happens with famous people all the time they become famous out of nowhere and they're they had a certain maturity level and after you become famous, it doesn't make you more mature all of a sudden. I think creators that do have a larger following um, really have to understand that they're leading. Like, and it's very hard to not take things personal on social media, especially when people are saying, cause that's, you're, you're speaking death over people when you're saying you're, you're this, you're this person, you're this, you're this, and you're constantly hearing that. It's hard to push that back and say, no, I'm actually this, you know, but all that to say, like at the end of the day, my, our self-worth, but specifically I can only take account for myself. My self-worth doesn't come from what people say about me whatsoever, like not even in the slightest. So I think that's why a lot of these things I'm like, I don't really understand that much. You know, I'm not like, Oh man, there's all this drama. There's, I'm just like, oh, people are discussing things. But then the deeper I get into it, I'm like, oh no, everyone's taking it really personal, including larger creators. And I'm not thinking, oh, these certain creators, because that, that video that I posted, people were like, oh, you're talking about this creator. And I wasn't whatsoever, like not even in the slightest. People were putting words in my mouth, but that's a whole nother thing. I'm not going to get too much on a soapbox about that, but we can't take things personal like people keyboard warriors like all these different things they're they're gonna say whatever the heck they're gonna say and sometimes it gets under my skin i'm not saying i'm perfect or i'm even close to being good at that but none of this is personal man like we're we i, I was having a conversation with somebody recently and they were like they started this to uh just to talk about the stuff that they loved and to share their craft, you know, they, that's how, that's why they started. And now all this drama and stuff happens. But I think I would say to that person and to myself with that is, well, then why do we have to let it bother us? You know, why do we have to get at each other's throats and the whole thing with Gerald and all these different things? Like, I, 
When I went to, and this clicks even more for me after going to NAB. Side note, comparison is stupid. It's, I think it's, there's a phrase that says comparison is a thief of joy and that there's a reason for that. It's not just a mantra. There's, I do think there's a spiritual side to all of that. But um, after going to NAB and seeing, man, the, the, the B&H party and we're all just having drinks and laughing and dancing and having cigars and, and just literally just having a ball. No one was a filmmaker on that dance floor. No one was, uh, I didn't look at someone and think 200,000 subscribers. I didn't look at that one person that had a million and think million. I was just, we were just, I was just laughing, dancing, having fun. Like there was no titles. There was nothing, you know? And, and it was in that point where for me it clicked. I'm like, oh, we're, we're all just creators having fun. Just, enjoying ourselves but then we get back home we read comments we do all that stuff and then it's just work <laughs> it's like all this other drama but but I, I definitely feel like it's also there's a bit of like people and i mean both of us have like uh are both believers and both mm -hmm. christians i wear yeah. it on my literally wear it on my sleeves <laughs> <laughs> um but i think it's it's that there is a part where it's like I speak for myself, but I'm pretty sure this is for you too, where it's like our identity isn't in this equipment. Our identity isn't in what the videos we create. Our identity isn't in the products we review. Yeah. Um, and the money it's we hard. Make. To, yeah, exactly. Like, it is hard because it's like we put a lot of effort, we put a lot of time, we create something like completely out of nothing. I say in quotes because technology and stuff, but. We create something out of nothing. We put it out there to the world. And then like people will rip the creators apart or they'll rip the video apart. And it's like, there. I think it's a twofold. It's one, people can like, I think from the viewer's perspective, like there's n n no way to stop this. There's always going to be the keyboard worries out there, but it's people need to realize, okay, you need to separate the product from the creator first off and foremost. It's like, the creator, like for the most part, most people that are making videos about products are saying their truthful opinions majority of the time. Sure, can there be shills out there that say whatever just for however mm -hmm. much they get paid? Yeah, but a lot of them out there, like really, I don't think there's many people. Yeah, yeah, I really don't think there's many. And I'm consciously like, doing it. Sorry. Right. No, no, for sure, for sure. And, and I feel like the people that are out there that are like, I'm just gonna say what something positive, no matter what, are like the people that probably aren't taking off on youtube because people can see authenticity people can like see if you're being like truly yourself and i think that's like something i love about doing this podcast is like i'm able to be more me because like i do have a little bit of that youtube personality where it's like i say it's me me times two where it's like it's just a more of a professional presentation when i make a video about a product retention there's a lot exactly. of other things yeah yeah versus this is more of down to earth casual conversation but so i think that's the first thing and the second thing is just like you know once you start becoming a creator even like we have like a mutual friend who got product sent from zoom with 80 subscribers you know it's like all people Oliver. like exactly Ernest. who's also check been, out his who's, channel he's a great he's a he's a he's a great he's, human a kind he's, a, he's been I on this him. podcast too yeah, um, yeah, but it's like, you know, people generally do want to be hyped about products. There, there, obviously, there is a reviewer bias, no matter what. If you get something sent for free, if you get something paid for, no matter what. At the end of the day, even if you mention the cons in the video, there's no matter what. There's going to be a reviewer bias and i kind of like how you mentioned in your video which i think this is going to be the wording i start to use more now on is like i'm still going to talk about the cons still going to talk about what's wrong with products but it's definitely at the end of the day it's a showcase if you're not the one spending your own money on a product it's a showcase at the end of the day because it's not your money that you're paying the value into and yes you can still talk about the reviews you could still talk about the cons of it and all of that but there is definitely like, you know, with both of us over 5,000, you just hit 6,500 let's go. 
but woo. Uh, but with all of that said, it's like companies consistently reach out to both of us, like with products, with like opportunities, like, hey, we want to send you this product if you want to review it. And it's like a lot of time we are saying no. And like now my rule of thumb is like, all right, if I'm not willing to buy the product myself, I don't know if I want to review it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's a, it's the same for me. Like um, this one company, and it, it's funny because companies send you products for what you really, you make reviews for. So like I have a bunch of tripods now because <laughs> I made a couple tripod videos and like I have anamorphic company, anamorphic lens companies like hitting me up and stuff. Um, and I'm happy with my Blazar Remus lenses, even though there is that drama behind Blazar, like I'm happy with the lenses. Like I don't need anamorphic lenses. If you want to send it to me with no strings attached, like sure, I'll, I'll, I'll take the free gear and maybe I'll love it. Maybe I'll, uh, I'll make a video about it. Um, if, if I like it, but yeah, no, it definitely becoming selective. Funny enough. I wish I could take credit for that showcase thing. I just saw other creators do it. So <laughs> it's like, it makes sense. He's like, blank blank paid me so this is not a review this is a showcase i'm showcasing this product telling you guys how but yeah man honestly with the whole even the video that i made um i am grateful for this moment just to talk about it because it's my main frustration and this isn't to defend myself and whatnot this is to further emphasize the point that i was trying to make with making that video is, and Gerald's point, funny enough, is camera companies need to be okay with negative feedback and they need to send stuff to people knowing that they're gonna give negative, feed, negative feedback, unbiased stuff. The per person I was speaking to said, oh, these camera companies, it's a clear communication. They know that if, if, if they say, if we say something, or if they, they know that if they're gonna put conditions on us, then we're, they're, they're gonna see the, the negative effects from that. And I don't agree with that. These companies are so smart. They're, they're not stupid. They're not dumb whatsoever. So they know that they can manipulate people. And people are pretty easily manipulated with more opportunities, more gear, and they'll still say, these companies will still say, you can say whatever you want. Is that an overheating warning? Lumix S9, baby, come on, <laughs> come on. All right. Let's see when it'll die. It's at 51 minutes, but um, they'll, they'll say you could say whatever you want, but then if you say whatever you want, there you probably won't be a part of the next product launch and they won't tell you anything you'll just find out about the product on the day of launch and as a creator you will most likely feel fomo they'll be like oh why didn't they send me this product why didn't they reach out to me to do this and that's very human that's, that's a very human reaction. It makes sense. There's nothing wrong with having that reaction. But my whole point of my video was to talk about the companies, not creators. And four or five different points in my video, I said, this is not about the creators. But that's besides the point. I'm not gonna defend myself anymore. I just, I really did wanna clarify that because there was a good bit of misunderstanding with that video, which is, uh, unfortunate you you can link it below if you want so people know what the heck we're talking about but uh. i think it is also interesting because like you know someone who's been to the japan but i've also been to the lumix collective retreat trip uh, and it is interesting because it's like i think it's also i think there's a time and a place to say the negative things that are the obvious things you physically can't change in something say it in, in a public space so it's like the people and consumers who are buying a product know what's up. Hey, there's no record limit. Hey, there's no mechanical shutter. Hey, there's no hot shoe. Hey, the HDMI is micro and it's on the right side of the handle, which makes no sense. Say those things on the public. But I think it's also, there's a perspective and a professionalism where it's like, if I think there's a difference between like uh, 
giving constructive feedback versus giving pure hate. And like personally speaking, I know I've talked to Lumix about like they gave us the firmware update prior to the October 8th and I was testing it out and I'm like, hey, this is a bug, this is a bug, this is a bug, this is a bug. And I sent them all of that. I didn't have to say this, all this stuff in my video because there's no purpose. I'm like, here's all the bugs and they fixed it. Why? And, and there's no at no necessary reason to give an unnecessary hate towards a company if you can just have the relationship with a company. And it's, it's hard because a lot of companies don't want that at, at some point or they're gonna side it, question and be like, oh, well that will be coming out in another firmware update. And like, there's just, those issues too. Yeah, well, but it's, that's like it's, a bad relationship. <laughs> and they're like gaslighting right. you. <laughs> yeah, so, but I think there is, there is value in giving your constructive criticism directly to the company before taking the criticism to the public because there's certain things where it's like, here's what p viewers should know for purchasing a camera or purchasing lenses or purchasing whatever. Here's what the viewers need to know. But if there's feedback on the back end that can be fixed, like talk to people. Because at the end of the day, most of the time, at, not all companies, I'm not speaking for all companies, but certain companies like will take that feedback, will take the criticism, will improve on products. Condor Blue is a good example of this, of also like improving on products and speaking to them directly. You yeah, know, I do think they've improved a lot. Yeah. Right. And I think there's a lot of companies that do it as long. And you just, I think creators just need to know. It's like, there's a difference between, again, like I said, difference between constructive criticism versus just pure hate on YouTube. And drama. So I guess, yeah. And drama, yes. Yeah. So I have two more questions. The first mm -hmm. one for you is going to be, what do you think creators need to do more in the future to fix this drama issues what's been happening on the platform i was about to say just we just need to be better people but but besides that like um yeah we're we're serving as creators like we're, we're serving our people you know we're serving our community and yeah there's it's kind of hard that our community sometimes hates and like speaks negative negative negatively about us um but I just think having the mentality of serving our people and as viewers, because I don't think it's just creators, responsibility. Like I think uh, as viewers, we just, yeah, just encourage one another. I mean, there, there are videos that I watch that like irk me because it's someone that doesn't know what they're talking about saying some ridiculous comment like, hey, I want 18 stops of dynamic range. And I'm like, what? Do you even know what dynamic range is? 18 stops. Like our eyeballs are 20 something and we see everything. Like you're, you're crazy. Yeah. Um, so I guess before we kind of dive into the last question and landing the plane here today, um, where can people check you out on the interwebs? Um, and where do you want to send everyone? So my YouTube channel is my name with two Z's. So Anthony Rodriguez with an extra Z at the end. Um, yeah, it's just my YouTube channel. I mean, you could check out my Instagram as well, but uh, or my website if you want to hire me. I will make you fire content and make you a lot of money through making the right videos, not just cool videos for your company. But cool. Well, I guess the the last and final question, which is actually kind of interesting, because you did maybe touch point on this, is what are viewers watching you know the camera industry what should they expect and be responsible for because as much as we put everything on the creators it's also on the viewers at the end of the day to make their own decisions and their own purchases you just don't make as many assumptions as you think like you don't you don't know everything you know I, like <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna get the raw honest truth with me or at least what i think is true but just don't make uh assumptions about creators or like what other people think and um oh at least at least if you're gonna make uh if you really want to type something and you want to make a comment at least watch the whole video please <laughs> like just watch the whole thing can't count how many times i've gotten comments telling me i'm stupid because i didn't mention something and then pff, a little past halfway 
I mentioned that. And I just put the timestamp and I'm like, there you go, buddy, in a very condescending way because they frustrated me. But <laughs> at least watch the whole video. And if you want to be an incredible human being and just win at life, uh, if you want to make a, and you really want to comment, if you want to make a gen generalized accusation about a person, go to their channel. You don't even have to watch every single video, but if you're gonna say this person is not a cinematographer, they don't do this professionally, maybe they just use autofocus and uh, it's because they're not a real professional, check their channel. You might find behind the scenes videos of them on actual jobs, paying them a lot of money. So, and using autofocus. I'm not talking from personal experience, I'm just making this scenario up. <laughs> Just kidding, but okay. but yeah, that that's well, probably that's what you can do as a viewer to uh, yeah be better. Well, thanks, man, for hopping on today's episode and joining me on the Lumix Curious podcast. Yeah, dude, I hope it wasn't uh, too intense and nitty gritty for you, and you'll actually still post it. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching this episode, talking to Anthony about the whole YouTube drama as a whole, shooting on Lumix and all of that good stuff. If you wanna hear an episode and conversation of me talking to the man behind Lumix Live, check out that episode right there. YouTube recommends you might like this episode right here. Till the next one, guys, peace.